chamber, then the factor line shift is zero as well. And one is left with this term. So the combination of this tensor term with this uh, rotating magnetic field gives us an interesting control panel token. We have the control waveform here is just this angle associated with the directed magnetic field. And then this is a term that was proportional to the tensor line shift with this capital K depending on the intensity and the tensor polarizability. And so now, the question, are these enough to generate the algebra SU 2F plus 1 for an arbitrary F, where F, say, is 7? I mean, F is 3, or F is 4 in cesium. And so 2F plus 1 is 7 or 9. What do you think? Right, that's what you got to think about. So fx with fy gives us fz, and then fz with fx gives us fy. So that's fine. But when I combine commute fx with fx, well, that doesn't do anything. But fx with fy gives me like fy fz plus f or minus something, right? So here are some of the commutators in this algebra. And in fact, what you see is each time you commute fx squared with some polynomial, you get another term. It gets to a higher order polynomial. And in fact, no matter what f is, you will generate all of the polynomials. You can think about them as like the spherical harmonics or the solid harmonics. So I can, one can generate, not just me, uh, an arbitrary unitary on this space with this Hamiltonian. All I have to do, I can keep k constant, turn on the light, leave it there, and then turn on the current and just rotate the, the magnetic angle. And for some particular choice, one can generate the arbitrary unitary transformation on the system. That's pretty cool. Yes, sir. But the thing is, you have an infinite number of commutators, so how do you know like, how close you can get to a particular unitary transformation? Okay, so let's see, a few, a few points. For a given f, the dimension is finite. So eventually, these commutators come back to themselves because, for example, you know, fx squared for um, spin one half is the identity, so you don't generate anything new. For f equals one, fx cubed is equal to fx. So you never get infinite polynomials, you get a finite order because the number of spherical harmonics that can be supported on this is finite. So you know, you can just do the algorithm, you know how many you need because you know the dimension of the algorithm. All right. Um, I should mention from a practical point of view, uh, although in principle the system is controllable, one practical question one has to worry about, which was mentioned before the break, is that this constant is, in some sense, can never scale any better than the photon scattering. I mean, you might have a proportionality constant here, out here, maybe a order 10 compared to the photon scattering rate, that constant I'm calling beta here. But I can never make this really, really big compared to the photon scattering rate, which means I can only do control for some finite time before photon scattering will ruin this. Um, we could do a lot of good, if this is order 10, you could do a lot of good uh, coherent control and, and in Paul's lab it's been done, really nice control. But ultimately if you want to get beyond that, you need to think about more and we'll, we'll talk about that too. Okay. 
So, what we've said at this stage, let's uh, take a quick breather thing. What we've just said is, we just asked the question, is the system controllable? Is there some way to modulate these uh, waveforms in order to generate the arbitrary quantum evolution that you want? It doesn't tell you how to find what that quantum evolution is. It just says it exists. So the challenge then is find the waveform. And that's the business of what's called optimal control theory. Um, so the question is, given some control system, how do we choose the waveforms to, to achieve our objective? Well, we saw in some cases, it might just be that we know a solution because there's an analytic decomposition. We have the Euler angle. So if I just had the ability to, say, turn off fields in X and Y, I could just do it. But quite often, for more complicated groups, those uh, analytic decompositions don't exist, or if they do, they may, you may not have the pieces that uh, they belong to. So, quite often, in most of the case, we turn to numerical optimization, either you know, minimizing some cost and, or, or maximizing some objective. I couldn't decide whether this icon should be the objective or the cost. It sort of depends on your your point of view. Um, so, for what are some examples of cost functions? Well, it really depends on what is your control task. So, for example, you might say, I want to do state mapping. Let's say maybe I optically pump, I produce a polarized atom, and I want to make an arbitrary superposition, quantum superposition, in my Hilbert space. So I've made some well-defined initial state, and I want to control it to an arbitrary target within the Hilbert space. So in this case, I want to, say, maximize the fidelity of, uh, oh, this is totally screwed up. Sorry, this, this, is, um, this is not what I need to say. This is what I need to say. Uh, I want to uh, optimize the fidelity between the evolved state and the target state. Okay? Sorry. Mm -mm -mm. Um, now, this is not the same thing as optimizing the full unitary map, which might, I might look at as a say, here's my target unitary, this is the unitary produced by my controls, and I want to optimize some kind of inner product between those two matrices. This is a different problem than this. This is, in some sense, just optimizing one column of the matrix, because I know what my initial state is. With this, this would produce a V that does something that does the desired map, no matter what the initial state was. This is, in some sense, an easier problem. So, the, yes? Okay, so down at the bottom, you don't need that last class to go to target unitary. Oh, God, yeah, cut and paste. I didn't even notice it. Sorry. Yeah. Fix these slides. All right. Sorry. Thanks for noting that, Paul. OK. So, the question, these are my, this, so now I have an objective function, and I want to optimize it. So, the way this is typically done is, first of all, let's think about my um, objective function as a function not, as a, I mean, right now it's a functional. It's a functional of the control function. But instead of thinking about the control function, I'm going to think about it as a countable number of variables. So I'm going to, in some way, discretize the control wave function, for example, stroboscopically. And then I have some objective function, which is uh, a function of, say, the magnetic field at some, you know, every 10 microseconds. So now this is a huge hypersurface, which I this, might, this is the fidelity, which is a function of what the magnetic field angles were, or the magnetic fields were, 
at different points in time. And we want to optimize that, which means we want to find the critical points, and hopefully they are the maxima, and optimize that. Now, remember we had that landscape, and we were you know, climbing all over the landscape. We wanted to try to find the peak, say, of the landscape. So this is the problem of how easy it is to find the peak of that landscape. And that turns out to be a problem that's been studied in great depth by, by uh, Hirsch Roberts' group, uh, this notion of a controlled landscape. One way to try to optimize this is just keep climbing the gradient and just keep going up. You haven't reached the peak, it just keep going up and up and up until you can't go up anymore. The question is, are you, if you do that, will you just you follow the gradient, will you end up in a local valley and just get trapped there? And what does the landscape look like? Well, it turns out in this problem, there is, it turns out the nature of the unitary matrices is great. It turns out that this landscape for the problem of state mapping is incredibly favorable. That is to say, there are, if I had as much time as I wanted to do this control, I can change my controls as fast as I want, then every peak of this surface is one. There are no, not only are there no traps, but there are no false optima. This is for pure unitary transformations, infinite bandwidth. So of course it's not totally uh, true in the lab. Not every point is exactly the same, but as far as the nature of the controllability problem, uh, it says it's a, it's a beautiful starting point. What it says is, take a random seed for your control waveform, throw down a hundred of them, and then just climb the landscape, and you'll find a hundred peaks. They're all possible control waveforms that generate the control you want. In principle, all of them are equally good. In practice, they're not. You can then rerun that in your computer code, put in decoherence, put in photon scattering, put in finite bandwidth, put in background noise, and see which one survives the best and use that. So um, here's an example. I think we'll see this again in Paul's talk, but it's good to see things again because maybe reinforcement's a good thing. Here's an example. Paul made this slide, so I give credit for it. Um, where, just to give you some intuition about how this control works, okay? I have a couple more slides left. Let's say that initially we're going to, so this control is making an arbitrary quantum state in, a, in F equals 3. That quantum state is being shown here as a plot of the elements of the density. So the diagonal elements are the populations, and the off-diagonal elements are the coherences. In this case, let's just say we want to make the state, which is an uh, equal superposition here, unnormalized, of magnetic sublevel n equals 2 and n equals minus 2, as an example. Now what comes out of the lab, say, is optically pumped n equals 3 along the y direction. And I want to get from here to here. And all I'm going to do is keep this bathed in light at the right detuning and right intensity, and then rotate this magnetic field around. And the question is, what angles, as a function of time, do I need this magnetic field to be at in order to get from here to here? Well, the way we do it is, well, now I'm going to go here because I noticed that for some reason my PowerPoint is not showing the last few frames of the movie. So I'm going to show you the movie over here. So what's being shown over here is here's a random seed of those angles as a function of time over, oh, what is it, uh, 400 microseconds? And if we did these angles as a function of time, this is the fidelity we would see. We would make a state that looked nothing like this state. So now, what we do is 
we move up the gradient. And as we move up the gradient, what you see is we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to that final oops, thing until eventually, from the theory point of view, we would get 99%. So this are, these are the angles as a function of time that one would apply that would evolve the state from the spin coherent state to this superposition. Let's see how that works. Uh, no, here. Right. Okay, so, um, so now what's being shown here is a picture of the spin, a different representation of the spin as a kind of wave packet. <laughs> Okay, it's what we call a spin Wigner function. Pierre mentioned the Wigner function earlier. So this is the initial state, which is spin polarized along the y direction. Here's the y direction. It's, a, it's like a wave packet pointing along y. Here's the state, which is the superposition of these two. It's got the, these kind of yucky colors are negative probabilities. They are the interference effects corresponding to the fact that this corresponds to not spin along any direction. It's a superposition state. And now what I'm going to show you in this movie 